here. So the fourth lab that I'd like to show everyone is the, the COVID-19 modeling that we've done, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're, we're not all in Houston right now, like we sort of wish we were. And um, uh, COVID-19 is to blame. So, you know, what can I do? Well, I can take my uh, computational modeling and I can try to figure out what's gonna happen next. And, uh, you know, so let's, you know, let's see if we can build a model doing that. So um, what we did, and you can see this is all from our recent publication, Epidemiological Modeling and Stochastics Live. So please take a look at that. Uh, it's some fantastic work in there. We're gonna build an SIR style model of COVID-19 infection within a single population. So SIR stands for susceptible, infected, removed. Um, but actually we wanna build a much more complicated model. It turns out that uh, SIR doesn't work great for COVID-19. Um, so we did this expanded model. So you've got susceptible, uh, exposed, infected, removed, but even that wasn't quite enough. So we have this SEYRDC model, which I'll go through in just a second. And then um, just, we had to choose a population. So in our paper, we actually chose two populations um, and they were the populations of that we are members of. So I am currently in Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville, North Carolina is in Buncombe County. So uh, I'm gonna use Buncombe County or vaguely Buncombe County data. Okay, so looking at our model here. So the idea is that everyone starts out susceptible. Um, you haven't seen this virus before and you could easily get it. So then the rate at which you get exposed is the number of infected people you're gonna come in contact with and also this parameter beta divided by the total population size. So once you're exposed to the virus, um, what we've you know, seen in some of our things is that you tend to become symptomatically infected or asymptomatically infected. Um, either way, you're able to pass on the virus, but if you're asymptomatic, then you tend to maybe just get cleared. Um, you, know, you, you, you got a lucky version of it and you didn't really know you had it ever. If you're symptomatically uh, infected, then you know you probably went to the hospital and uh, you know have some sort of medical record that indicates that you um, that you had COVID nineteen. So um, if you went to the hospital, there are two options: you, you recovered from the hospital, or you unfortunately did not. So those those are those two parameters there. Um, these this sort of flow diagram turns into this uh, set of mechanistic reactions, right? So. If a susceptible and an infected come in contact, um, then they, the, that infected is still infected, but now the susceptible individual is an exposed individual. The exposed individual then has some sort of incubation period. And after that incubation period, they're gonna move to either the infected or symptomatic uh, uh, categories. And just to make things more interesting, right? We talked about uh, biochemical species or variables. Um, this, uh, uh, in ep epidemiology, they call these compartments. So the susceptible compartment, the infected compartment, the exposed compartment, the symptomatic compartment. Um, I'll, I'll usually probably just refer to them as uh, uh, variables at this point. So exposed goes to symptomatic, and then symptomatic uh, uh, goes to recovered or to dead. Um, and it's also possible that if you were the asymptomatically infected, you're just gonna go to cleared. So, this is a much more complicated model, but uh, you know I'm just going to list out all of my variable compartments there, uh, parameters and reactions, and we can actually build this up very quickly. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go to new model. I'm going to call this COVID nineteen. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go with the concentration concentration model, and we're we're gonna stick with the concentration model actually on this one. So um, let me make this slightly smaller so I can put this all on one page. So these values here are actually the initial conditions, or whichever value we need for that particular compartment. So I'm gonna have a s variable, and that's gonna start out with twenty five thousand. Uh, 258,340. 
add a variable e. This is going to start at 900, add a variable i. Uh, that'll be 378, add a variable y for symptomatic. Now, uh, uh, just to be clear, that y is actually the SIR convention. So uh, we did not make that up. 252, add a variable recovered. Uh, we'll set that as 100. Add another variable dead, that's 30. And the final variable is going to be cleared. That'll be zero. I guess instead of dead, I'll just say D. Click save variables. Looks like I did that correctly. Excellent. All right, we only have four parameters here. So let's add parameter. This is going to be beta 1.0. Kappa, 0 0.3, Delta, 0 0.005, and new 0.2. And I'll go through these in a second about what they actually mean. So I'm going to save parameters here. Okay, 1.3, 0 0.005, 0 0.2. Perfect. All right, so now I'm going to move this over here so I can do the reactions. So first you can say S plus I equals E plus I. I believe that I can do this one. Yes. So this is two species go to two species. Um, and you know, by default, we just always select the first species, but S and I goes to E and I. And that happens at this complicated rate here. Now, if it was just beta times S times I, I could just leave it as is, but unfortunately I can't. So I'm gonna have to start over here, remove, add reaction. This is gonna be custom propensity. Um, and then I'll do it again. So, okay, so we have S here and then an S and an I come in contact with each other and that produces an E and an I. So S plus I goes to E plus I and it's gonna do it at the rate beta times S times I times 250000. And then just to be clear, this is basically the, the base population of the region. Uh, okay, so that's my first reaction there. And then you can see all the other reactions are actually uh, unimolecular, right? So they're, they're just transition reactions. So we've got the transformation reaction. So we can just uh, so I'll call this exposure, call this. So if we're gonna go from an E to an I, that is gonna be asymptomatic. A-S-I-M-P-T. I'll just shorten that a little bit. Um, and that is gonna happen at, again, a more complicated rate. So unfortunately, I'm gonna to to start over again, come back here, custom propensity, and then this is gonna be E goes to I, and the rate is gonna be one minus nu times 0 0.16 times E. So uh, if you're wondering where these numbers came from, I would actually encourage you to uh, uh, look at our, our paper in bioinformatics. We have uh, we did some some pretty uh, uh, complex parameter fitting um, with the the given data that that was uh, out there, um, and you know I think it's some great work. So A S Y M P T. So E goes to I at this complicated rate. Perfect. Add another reaction. Let's see this one. Yep, that's another custom propensity. So I'm just going to skip that first step and then call this simp. This is going to be new times 0 0.16 times E. So, um, and this is going to be that E goes to Y. That looks all correct. Okay, so now kappa, delta, kappa, these are going to be just simple mass action reactions. So I can use my, uh, my transformation reaction here. 
So it's going to be recovery. Uh, recovery is going to be y goes to r. Add reaction, transformation. This is going to be death, the unfortunate one. This is going to be y goes to d. And then finally, we've got clearance. So that's going to be this last reaction, transformation. I and C. Oop. But I didn't actually change the parameter on any of these three, so that's a problem. We'll jump back here. This is supposed to be kappa. This is supposed to be delta. And this one is supposed to be kappa. Save reactions. Double check all this looks correct, does seem to look correct, perfect. Um, so let's see, I think I want to go out to 100 and I'll make this every half a time point. Simulate, preview, Hmm. So when I did it earlier, this is what I got. Um, what did I do differently? Hmm. Well, this is a... Uh, interesting. I'm just going to change that to there, and this is going to go back to there. E. Ah, I know what the problem is. This is supposed to be divided by, so this is much too high. Okay, so we'll hide that. Edit reaction. There we go. Show preview. Um, except this needs to go to 100 now. Okay, this looks a lot more like what I'm thinking about. So we've got our S susceptible here that basically everyone starts, starts susceptible or most people do, and then that goes down to very few at the end. Um, we've got our cleared, that's most. I just want to show you, these two are sort of dwarfing the rest, and I can't see, so let's go ahead and remove S from that. Um, so you can double click that, and then, yeah, I want to get rid of cleared too. So now you can see the exposed, you know, peaks right around day 37, 38 here. Um, Let's see, removed, so recovered. So these are all the recovered ones. And then let's see, at the end, we get what? After about 100 days, we've got 800 dead here in Buncombe, Buncombe County. It's a, you know, sad state of affairs. Um, great. So this was our COVID-19 model. Um, and, you know, we can do some parameter fitting. Um, ah, yes. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. R and C are different states. So um, this comes from observability, um, right? Both R and C are people who had the virus but don't anymore. However, um, if you're looking at uh, medical data, the group that never reported that they got uh, COVID has no data. So you can't you can't fit your parameters to that. However, there's a group that, a uh, 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 subset of that group that uh, got it badly and they are in the data. So you can look at the number of people who got sick and reported it and number of people who died. Um, and those are two separate data, but, but the number of people who got sick and the number of people who, or the number of people who reported who got sick and the number of people who were actually sick were very different or, or, or different groups of people. So we have to do some inference on what percentage of the 
population that actually is. And uh, that can be done by looking at those, that, those two pieces of data. Um, so yes, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, any other questions about our, our COVID model here? Um, I won't claim any particular predictability from this model, but it does show some very interesting uh, uh, patterns and trends, or at least not, not within this uh, presentation anyway. Okay, um, let's see. I have one final thing that I'd like to show you, which is something I was talking about before, which is hybrid simulation or hybrid models. So we talked before, uh, we've got there our simulation engine here, the last Pi 2. It's, you know, this modeling, this Python modeling toolkit for biochemical simulation or, or simulation in general, uh, to create your mathematical models of biological systems, doing deterministic simulation, AKA floating point values, stochastic simulation, integer values. But it turns out that there's sometimes situations where you'd like to do um, uh, uh, both, um, or perhaps you don't know what you want. And that's really our objective here is to uh, take these sorts of really hard decisions um, and uh, sort of try to make them automatic. Um, so we want hybrid simulation to have both discrete and continuous values. So in our, uh, in our experience, there are two situations where, you're, uh, uh, where you want this. The first is coupled systems. So um, if you have a system that contains both discrete and continuous values, um, and those discrete and continuous values are coupled together, so there's some sort of interaction or reaction that is using, um, uh, 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 that is using the, the, uh, uh, these two things together, um, that you know we can we can simulate them that way. Sorry, I'm trying to see. Can I see the traditional compartment model? Um, sorry, I'll, uh, I guess I'll I'll get to that question at the end here. Um, uh, okay, so couple, uh, two two types: coupled systems where you have discrete and continuous variables that are interacting together, and then a second uh, situation for switching. So. Stochastic simulation is very efficient and, and very accurate at low populations. However, as the populations get bigger and bigger, the, uh, uh, the accuracy remains the same, but the efficiency goes uh, far away. Uh, it's, it's based, uh, your, your, your big O is based on the number of particles. As the number of particles goes up, if it's in the billions, your simulation probably doesn't have as much stochasticity as you'd like. Um, so it might be nice if we were able to switch our variable when it was low, we can be stochastic. When it's high, we can be continuous. And uh, you can kind of see here that we've got this curve here and at a certain point it switches, it goes below a certain threshold and below that threshold, then our variable uh, goes from a smooth continuous variable to a discrete stochastic variable. Um, and to show you this, um, I am actually going to go back to my projects. You can see all of my projects here. Um, this May Siam Conference mini tutorial uh, project is actually the project that I showed you. It is the one if you just click this link right here on this page, github.com slash stochasess slash stochasess underscore tutorial. Click this link right here. That will launch stochasess and get you right to here. And yeah, you can see we have uh, most of these things in here. Uh, what am I looking for? Uh, right, okay, so here's some workflows that we have. I'm gonna scroll down and I have a notebook, hybrid solver demo notebook. Okay, so I'm gonna double click this, launches that. Um, perfect, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do this the fast way and do run all. So here, what we've done, we've got this nice tutorial notebook. Um, and in that we've done these, both of these two models are in there. So hopefully we'll get uh, uh, plots that look pretty much like that. But you can say here, um, I'm doing simple hybrid model, which extends the glasspy 2model uh, class. And I name it, I make a species A uh, that's gonna have initial value zero. I make, make a, a second species V, initial value uh, one, 
and this is mode continuous. So um, this will force this to be uh, a continuous variable, while this one will set to be a, a discrete variable. And then I have two rate values. Um, um, and then I'm uh, showing here, I, I'm gonna make a rate rule. So um, I just want my variable V to vary with time, not with any other part of the system, but just vary with time. So the idea here is I was thinking we would have something like sunlight. So if you're, if you're looking at photosynthesis, the amount of sunlight per unit time is uh, uh, only a function of time, not, uh, uh, not anything else. So I can make a rate rule uh, that, and, and give it a mathematical formula. In this case, it's just cosine t, and it's gonna be you know, dx dt, or sorry, dv dt, equals cosine t. Uh, I'm gonna add my, add my rate rule here. And then I'm gonna add a reaction that takes nothing and produces uh, the a's, and it's gonna produce that at the propensity function, rate one times v. So v varies with cosine t, and a is created by the amount of v that is there. Um, and then my second reaction here, uh, I take one A and I go to zero. So this is A goes to, to nothing, this is nothing goes to A, and this is a custom propensity function, and this is just a random rate here, and these are just numbers here. We put this all together, and we select the tau hybrid solver. So this is a combination of, of, of tau leaping, uh, stochastic, and deterministic simulation all together. And you can see here, we've got this nice plot. And you can see that the amount of A here in blue varies quite dramatically uh, is coupled along with my, my uh, variable v here. Um, so that's our first model here. Um, and yeah, demonstrated using a rate rule and just coupling these together. And by coupling them together, I just mean that, that uh, these two values are within a propensity function. So there. All right, running low on time here. So I'm gonna try to go a little bit quicker through this. Um, so this is, oops, don't want to do that. Um, so this is our hybrid switching. So for modes for variables, you can choose to be continuous or discrete or dynamic. So dynamic is the default. Um, and we see here, we're gonna have three parameters, three species, and we're gonna leave all of these as dynamic species. Um, and then I have my reactions. Uh, a plus A goes to, uh, to B plus C. I have a B that goes to nothing and I have a C that goes to an A. This particular setup here, um, I make the model, I run the model and I specify my solver using the tau hybrid solver. And then you can see here, uh, actually, if I do, plot. Okay, perfect, right. So uh, this is the matplotlib plotting. This is the plotly plotting. And um, let's see. Looks like we didn't switch here. So I don't know what happened. Um, I have to investigate this and uh, get back to you. Apologize for that. Um, but yeah, you can see, no, is this is continuous, this is continuous. These seem to be all discrete, yeah. Um, X switching. I'm sorry. Here we go, right. These are supposed to be all discrete. Here, we're gonna change the tau tolerance to 0 0.04 increase the tall switching tolerance. So that tolerance tells us when we need to switch. And here, right. Okay, so now you can see as I move my cursor, the, that it's smooth along here, and then right here becomes stochastic. So the idea is that this is uh, 
uh, when it's above this particular tolerance value, you get smooth, you get uh, deterministic uh, dynamics. And when you fall below some threshold, uh, we do that, uh, uh, we switch to stochastic dynamics. So that's what you're seeing here. And then you can see a comparison of these two on top of each other. Okay. Um, I believe, yeah, I'm running real short on time here. So um, that is what I would like to wrap up today. Um, let me just, of course, uh, hybrid models. I just want to mention our, our Stokas team, which uh, we have uh, Professor Lind Linda Petzl, who, who just gave the intro, um, and uh, Richard Zhang is, is at UCSB. Uh, myself, Sean Matthew, Matthew Geiger, and uh, Brian Rumsey are at, at UNC Asheville. And in uh, Uppsala, we've got uh, Andreas Hellinger, Prashant Singh, and Frederick. And then I also want to mention that in all our projects, we've actually had a, a very large number of contributors. And I want to just, you know, without calling out individual names, mention everyone and, you know, give them a big thank you. Uh, this is all open source uh, development, um, all done with, uh, 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 you know, uh, for for uh, general simulation. And then I believe I had a question about the, comp the, the compartment. Um, so just wanted to uh, come back here. The, um, but uh, 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 any questions from the audience? Well, I want to thank you very much for having us here. Um, I want to remind you that we have uh, part two of this session tomorrow, um, where we're going to be going through our, our uh, inference session. And additionally, um, I will take the second half of that session and give us some more advanced uh, simulation, the, in, uh, including some of our new um, uh, spatial visualization. So uh, look forward to seeing you there. All right, thanks everyone.